But now I think we can say hello to Vanessa Andreotti, our keynote speaker. I don't think if I need to present her much. A teacher, a practitioner, a learner, exchange uh, uh, person to, to, to that, that uh, uh, is providing us with a reflection on, on, on uh, the, the edges of our experience, of our cognitive side, of our uh, feelings, and so on. That's what is also shaping our, our viewing the world, our... Uh, there are so many words I could say now, but I, I will stop here. But I have one small request before I give word to, 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 to Vanessa, is if because the, the, it looks like the internet is a little bit uh, slow in, 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 in this room, if we can drop off the Wi-Fi for the next 30 years, so that we, there will be no interruption. Uh, so there will be a clear flow between uh, 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 Vanessa addressing us and uh, us uh, listening to her. Uh, uh, Vanessa, uh, thank you for you being me? with. Uh, thank you for being uh, with us, and uh, next 25 minutes are, are, are yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alvin. Uh, can you hear me? Just I, I just need to know. Yes, if, very well. Yeah, you know, I do. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be here today. Uh, I have to start by saying that I'm speaking from the unceded ancestral territories of the Stolo indigenous peoples. Here in Canada, we start usually with the land acknowledgement. And uh, sometimes we also say that there's a commitment on our part to support indigenous people to reclaim the land that were stolen from them. So that's a request that indigenous people here uh, ask uh, panelists and speakers to do, and especially lectures at the university. So today we're going to be talking about global education in times of unprecedented challenges, and I'm going to be speaking a little bit about the work that I do with a collective, uh, the Gesturing Towards the Colonial Futures Collective. I will show a couple of examples of the work that we do, and I'll leave you with some questions about global education and the idea of a project that I'm working on with uh, Indigenous people in the Amazon as a global citizenship education pro uh, project that uh, tries to bring together all the ideas that I'm going to talk about today. So the first thing uh, I think I would like to say is that I work in a with a collective of people. So um, I'll just make this slide a little bit bigger. So it's a transdisciplinary collective of researchers, artists, educate, educators, students, and indigenous knowledge keepers that works at the interface of questions related to historical, systemic, and ongoing violence, and questions related to the unsustainability of our current habits of being. It brings together concerns related to racism, colonialism, unsustainability, climate change, biodiversity loss, economic instability, the global mental health crisis, and intensifications of social and ecological violence, including militarization and war. And what we're trying to do with the collective educationally is to build containers and collect collective capacity for engagements with global wicked challenges through critical and systems complexity literacies grounded on post-colonial, decolonial, indigenous, and non-Western psychoanalytic practices. So when I talk about wicked challenges in education, uh, generally, uh, people ask me, what, what are these wicked challenges? So wicked challenges is a ca category of challenges uh, that are um, hyper-complex, multi-layered, interlocked. So the solution for one thing creates problems in other places that involve many unknowns and that have longer and uncertain timescales. And there is an acknowledgement here that our, our formal education leaves us unequipped to address wicked challenges in the complexities, uncertainties, ambiguities, diversities, paradoxes, unequal power relations, and conflicts that are inherent in them. Uh, 
And if we address wicked challenges as regular problems, our interventions will tend to reproduce harmful patterns of number one, simplistic feel-good solutions that may address symptoms, but not root causes of problems, of systemic problems, two, paternalistic engagements with marginalized communities, and three, ethnocentric ideals of justice, sustainability, and change. So in terms of, of the work of the collective, we ground the work on four denials. And this is coming from a non-Western psychoanalytic practice coming from indigenous communities. So indigenous communities that we work with say that the problem is not a problem of information, really. It's a problem of a habit of being that is harmful. So this habit of being that is harmful is grounded on four denials. So the first one is the denial of systemic violence and complicity in harm. The fact that our comfort, securities, and enjoyments are subsidized by expropriation and exploitation somewhere else. So here, for example, we would think about the, uh, the fact that the minerals that were necessary for the technology that we use today were mined in uh, at communities in the global south through process of exploitation and expropriation. So there is a, a cost to the privileges that we have today. It's not necessarily just a question of exclusion of other people in terms of access to technology, but that this technology happens at the expense of other people and of the planet itself. The second one is the denial of the limits of the planet, the fact that the planet cannot sustain exponential growth in consumption at the rates that are promoted today. The third one is the denial of entanglement, our insistence in seeing ourselves as separate from each other and from the land rather than entangled within a, a living wider metabolism that is the planet that is also biointelligent. And the fourth one is the denial of the magnitude and complexity of the challenges we will need to face together. The tendency to look for simplistic solutions that make us feel and look good and that may address symptoms, but not the root cause of a collective complex predicament. So our collective also looks at the complex social educational context that we have today, which is not the same context that I had when I was growing up and going through the educational system. And, a lot of it is to do with how technology has changed our neurofunctional wiring. And here we have a list of things that we pay attention to, including the fact that we are operating in a context where there's a cacophony of perspectives or heteroglossia, as we call it in academia, where there's misinformation overload in the impossibility of stable authorities or imposed consensus. The second one is that there is an oversaturation of unprocessed emotions. There's a lack of resilience and collective capacity to process complex emotions within us and around us. Number three, VUCA. So uh, VUCA stands for increased volatility, uncertainty, social complexity, and ambiguity. So there's social fragmentation and polarized perspectives on the common good. Number four is meta consumption. So it's consumption as a mode of relating to the world where you don't consume only stuff, you consume knowledge, you consume critique, you consume relationships, you consume experiences. But this, this consumption doesn't mean you are digesting things. It's not necessarily leading to something different. And then the fact also that there are incentives and rewards for hedonistic, narcissistic, and hyper-individualistic behaviors in the societies that we live in. Number five is self-infantilization. So there is a proliferation of fragilities and entitlements, so a demand for coddling. And uh, indigenous people that we work with say that this represents the failure of the Western culture to produce grown-ups. So there's a focus on feeling and looking good and seeing hope as projection rather than relational weaving. This means that when we think about hope, we think about an image in the future rather than the weaving of relationships in the present and the staying with the difficulties of the present. We want an escape from those difficulties and an image of the future then that is projected as if if we had the image, we could all just uh, work towards that rather than dealing with what in my project we call the shit 
So we need to compost the shit to be able to get to the new soil that will lead to a different future. We cannot escape from what we have inherited in terms of difficulties of the present. And then the last one is intergenerational resentment. Uh, so we have we're reaching or have reached the limits of the planet. So the promises of endless prosperity are broken. And um, young people who work with us have described this, it as um, watching the world today is like watching a train wreck in slow motion. And some of the indigenous people we work with talk about climate change, for example, as a nuclear explosion in slow motion. So what do we do? What, how does education change or how does education have to change in order to be able to be effective in an environment like this, which is not the same environment that most of us grew up? So some of, these are some of the questions that I believe as educators, we all have to start asking in different contexts and we will probably arrive at diverse answers and we will need to be able to connect and exchange um, this form of inquiry. But here in Canada and in Brazil, which are the two places that I work, uh, we have created some tools that support people to sit with the difficulties of the present. And one of these tools is called the House Modernity Built. So this is a story about modernity. Right, our um, our current mainstream system in the global north, and that has been exported also to the global south. So I, I will tell the story very quickly uh, as a way of uh, illustrating the kinds of containers that we are talk we were talking about. So the story of the House of Modernity talks about a house that was built on a planet, and this house is now exceeding the limits of the planet. The house is built upon a foundation of separability, which is the separation of humans from the land, where humans uh, tend to be then at the center um, of the analysis and of the attention and be perceived as superior to other species because they reason and because they, um, um, they have language, articulated language. So the separability then creates a hierarchy between uh, land us and if, uh, between ourselves as well, different cultures and different uh, individuals contributing to the building of this house. In one um, carrying wall, we have the nation state, which we tend to think uh, that it's there to protect people. But if we look at the histo history of the modern nation state, we will see that at, at its foundation is the protection of property. And there are many studies especially in the US about how uh, the protection of people in terms of the granting of rights, civil rights, human rights, labor rights, uh, only happens when there's interest convergence with the protection of capital. When the protection of capital uh, is not convergent, uh, the interests of capital are not con convergent with the interests of people, generally the state will defer to capital. Uh, but I think that there are moments also that it, where it doesn't happen. And I think partly uh, we, we, are, we can see it uh, in different examples of history where that's, that was also not the case. So the other um, carrying wall is the carrying wall of universal reason. Here is the single story of progress, development, and civilization. That is a violent story that tries to eliminate other stories and other possibilities. So the problem with a single story is this elimination of other possibilities. And the roof of the, the house is the roof of global, speculative, um, logarithmic, capital. And that's, that kind of global capital is very different from industrial capital uh, or industrial capitalism because uh, it is, an, uh, it's, it, in a way, the speculative nature of it makes it anonymized and much less uh, responsible and dependent on nation states. So here you have a situation in the first frame, house is ex exceeding the limits of the planet. In the second frame, we have the hidden costs of the house. So inside the house, we have unsustainable growth and overconsumption. And then there are uh, arrows, uh, the arrow going into the planet as waste disposal, the arrow coming to the, from the planet uh, says expropriation. So the, this, and then in the middle of the planet, you have dispossession, destitution, and genocide. 
So the idea here is that the house has been created and is subsidized and maintained by violence by systemic, historical, and ongoing violence. The third frame talks about the floors of the house. So here we play with the idea of the global north and south. So the north of the north, which is the, which is the penthouse, it's people who have um, a, a historical discretionary income. And then we have the south of the north in the basement of the house of people who want the, uh, the securities of the house. Uh, and they generally serve the house. Uh, um, they do the work that other people don't want to do. But the most important thing is the north of the south, which is where the stairs of social mobility are. And these stairs are becoming narrower and narrower. And then we have the south of the south in the planet receiving the sewage of the house. And here are people working towards uh, different possibilities that are different from the house. But once uh, this possibility is becoming possible, they have to knock on the house as well and say, we, we need to get in because you have already destroyed our other possibilities for existence and our livelihoods. So in this frame, we focus on the fact that there is a promise of universal middle class for all, but we're not considering the costs of this, of this promise of expanding the house for in terms of the limits of the planet itself. And in the last frame, we have climate change, economic instability, the cancellation of rights, precarity, populism, causing structural damage in the house. So we have social, economic, political, um, mental health, and ecological crisis inside the house, and also violent conflict, mass and forced migration uh, in the planet itself that is already oversaturated. So here, the question is, do we fix the house? We expand the house, do we build another house? Do we live without a house? Uh, do we um, find another planet? And what we try to do with this, um, with this tools is to ask people to sit with the problem without trying to, uh, to jump to a quick fix. It's, it's more about expanding our capacity to sit with difficult things without feeling, feeling overwhelmed or immobilized in the process. And in terms of sitting with the questions related to the house, we also have this other tool that talks about three different possibilities when we realize the crisis that we're facing. One is soft reform of the house of modernity, where there's more modernity, the, the solution is more modernity, same forward, same leadership, small changes. So it's the same usual questions and the same answers. But we also have radical reform of the house, where we say there's it is still more modernity, but different leadership and larger changes. So here is where you see movements like the um, Black Lives Matter, um, Me Too, um, Roads Must Fall, for example, in South Africa, uh, arguing for uh, more substantial changes in leadership, different representation of, of, of people in this leadership, but also different ideas uh, permeate in the discussion. So here we have same questions, different answers. But there's also a, a, a kind of an increasing group of people talking about beyond reform of the house. Uh, people realizing that modernity, it may not be an option because of the violence that is required to expand modernity, but also the limits of the planet. Here we would have different questions and different answers. And even in this beyond reform, there would be several different possibilities, several different strategies. Some people want an alternative with guarantee, for example. Other people want uh, to hack the system. There's also the idea of hospice in the system, the idea that the system needs to teach us the, what it, it needs to teach us in its death before we can uh, figure out something that is genuinely different. And the last tool that I'm gonna show is the tool of the adjacent possible. This was a, a workshop um, that we, we started with a network of indigenous communities in Brazil, where uh, we wanted to see what's, what was their understanding of change. And what came up was that was the metaphor of mushrooms and mycelium, where you have two mushrooms there representing ecological and economic justice, but this is grounded in the soil, in the mycelium that is in the soil. So there, there, what's, what I think is represented here is that there's no way we can have ecological and economic justice without cognitive justice, affective justice, and relational justice 
in uh, grounding it. And the funny thing about this cartography, this, this map, was that uh, we had a very serious discussion about the concept of justice there too, because the indigenous communities felt that uh, justice is still this idea of something in the future and what we need to do is a weaving in the present. So they didn't want to use the concept of justice, they wanted to use the concept of healing, the healing of our thinking, which is the cognitive healing, the healing of our sensing and processing of emotions, which is affective healing, the healing of our relations. These three healings would lead to the healing of our exchanges, which is the economic healing, and the healing of our uh, sense of uh, belonging within Earth, and also our relationship with life and death. In that sense, learning to live and to die well. So with that, I think I'm going to, to conclude with two things. One is a warning. And the other one is a set of questions and then an example of something that we would like uh, to do that we're, we're already doing in partnership with indigenous communities. So the warning that I would like to put on the table is that um, after I think more than 20 years now in global education, global citizenship education, I find that there are some very problematic assumptions uh, in the field that are leading to something that is not very educational. So for the first assumption is that talking about negative things makes people feel demotivated, that complexity causes people to feel overwhelmed at the second assumption, that exposing complicities makes them feel uncomfortable, that the lack of simple solutions immobilizes people, that uncertainty makes people feel anxious, and that suggesting that big changes are coming can make people feel angry. So I've seen in my time in global education, a lot of people, and also because of the nature of, of working with NGOs, uh, wanting, so people want messages to be short, simple, easy, light, fun, and hopeful. However, I would like to invite you to think about the fact that education, if education is to do something different for these people, we actually need to help them sit with the complexity, sit with the uncertainty, rather than try to rescue them from these things. So I will leave you with the questions that I believe education should be asking, and that's, these are the questions that we're asking in, in our research collective. And the first one is, how do we prepare ourselves to tackle the wicked problems of our time, including unprecedented complex dilemmas and also disasters of our own making that we will have to face together? Two, how can we learn to do the kindest and most responsible thing to each other and to the land at all times, especially in times of crisis and polarization? Three, how can we learn to choose sobriety, maturity, discernment, and accountability in a culture of late modernity that often, that often promotes and rewards the opposite? And the last thing I would like to leave you with uh, is uh, a project that is being um, done in collaboration with the uh, Hunikui indigenous people of the Amazon. And it started with a campaign last year in the summer when they were facing enormous challenges with the Bolsonaro government who wanted to open up the Amazon to predatory industries and the indigenous people were the last line of defense. So they were being, what Bolsonaro was trying to do was to cancel their rights in order to take back their lands. And uh, my collective worked with the Federation of the Hunikui People plus a network of other indigenous communities in a campaign called Last Warning that is now going to be shifted towards a global citizenship education project called University of the Forest. But if you want to have a look at what we're gonna be doing, um, the Last Warning campaign has some of the um, sample um, resources that we created, including, for example, a diet, uh, an Amazon diet, where we would invite young people and teachers to not eat meat, soy, and corn for a week, but not just uh, the soy and corn um, in its, in its uh, form, but also the derivatives. So if you look at processed food, soy and corn is everywhere. Meat is actually easy to stop, but soy and corn is extremely difficult. So using that as, a, as an invitation to understand the interdependence and interconnectedness of our chains of production and consumption. There was also a book called um, the Amazon, uh, a forest called Amazon that sees the Amazon as a living entity, not as a forest, especially not as carbon trading. Uh, um, 
possibilities that sees the, the, the forest as a living entity that is being attacked by four different forces, uh, including greed, vanity, um, selfishness, I think is one of them. Can't remember the last one, but the book is available for free if you want to have a look. Uh, and the book also talks about the fact that indigenous peoples in the Amazon are putting their lives on the line uh, to stop the forest in, from becoming a savanna and, uh, and then accelerating climate change exponentially. exponentially. In the collaboration works, uh, this North-South partnership works uh, on a principle of carbon debt reparation. So we understand that we have a debt to these indigenous people and that what we can, um, uh, what can create over here in the global north needs to offer something that changes the conditions uh, that they are facing right now, both in terms of facing the violence that they are facing. And, and in that sense, for example, in the campaign in the summer, we had to, what they asked for were drones and body cameras to protect themselves from the land grabbers. Um, or uh, they also need funding to not only securitize their, their territories, but also to be able to survive in an environment that is being changed by climate change, basically. So they're facing droughts and floods uh, that are unprecedented and that we are also responsible for. So I'll leave you with that. And I think there are two questions that, uh, that can be asked, I think, in the time that we have left. But it's, it was a pleasure to speak to you today. And I'm looking forward to the discussions as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vanessa, for uh, these inspiring words. The, my first feeling when I'm listening to, to uh, such, an, such, su such words is that I need a time for reflection. You know, because it's, uh, it's the density of this... Uh, 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 of uh, now I'm missing English words for that, you know. Uh, but not, not I'm not going to talk about my feelings. I share it with you. Uh, the, we still have some minutes for if there is any question. Uh, it's now to just to have Vanessa to to tell, and then we will move to to the uh, reflection uh, panel, uh, where I would like to invite uh, Patricia, uh, Rilly, and uh, Max. I hope Miguel is also with us uh, to the to the floor. And is there any question that anybody would like to ask? Thank you, Marie. Hi, Vanessa. I hope you can hear me well. I'm Marie from Estonia, and. Um, uh, when you say uh, we have uh, made all the messages too easy or simple, uh, and on the other hand, uh, the world is getting more and more simplistic uh, in a way that our um, attention span is, what, a few seconds, less than some fish. Uh, so um, maybe we should have tried the difficult questions or difficult wordings 10 years ago, but probably it's too late. So can't we just go now with, there's just chaos waiting and I don't know. Because I think uh, difficult messages won't get anywhere if our uh, attention span is so small. Thank you for the question. That's a great question to discuss as educators too, right? So not just as as campaigners, and I, I, I wear both hats. Um, there was um, a lot that we learned in the last warning campaign working with young people and how they are, um, how they are uh, associating social media, for example, with the campaigns. And I think a, a short answer to what you're saying is that if the message is simple, it also gets uh, drowned in a sea of other messages that are over there and that are being consumed for, um, for specific things uh, that do not necessarily lead to change either. So we have a problem. It's a wicked problem. Actually, global education is a wicked problem that we have to sit with in a very different way. So the, as you said, the, making it difficult is not an answer. Making it easy is also not an answer. 
what do we do? And that these are important questions, I think, for us to, and what do we do in a way that has consequence, not in a way that just is repeated and retweeted, right? And in the, in the campaign, we, we learned about that. So we were trying to um, raise awareness of what was happening in Brazil with this uh, landmark Supreme Court case. And we got the attention of some people, but that didn't lead to anything. The, the communities needed the drones, needed the body cameras, and needed, needed um, substantial support. And retweets, do, they, they make it look great, but it's, there's, there's a philosopher that calls it outrage porn, right? That we feel that we're doing something, but actually nothing happens. So we need to talk about that as well. And it's a longer conversation, but thank you for the question. Thank you very much for your reply, uh, Vanessa. Now I'm inviting uh, Rili, Patricia, and Max to, to join me on, on the floor. Uh.